Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also uh, very happy to be here and to present this short lecture for the So, uh, the title of my lecture is Constitution Making Process in Comparison. Uh, first of all, I have to mention that I will go ahead in another way than the uh, speaker in the morning. I will read uh, my lecture. So, Constitution Making Processes in Comparison. Let me begin with a short excerpt of a recent article of Francis Fukuyama which concerns the actual internal affairs of Hungary and uh, has been published in the last, last issue of the magazine The American Interest. So the excerpt. In terms of the formal powers the new constitution grants the Hungarian executive, they are not greater than those traditionally possessed by, <coughs> the, by a British Prime Minister. So the real difference between Hungary and the Orban and the classic British governments does not lie in the formal allocation of powers in the political system. The problem lies entirely in how those powers are used. The new Hungarian constitution is bad not so much for what it is, but, it re but, but what it reveals about the long-term proclivities of its authors. If the political will exists, to do something, even in a system with a lot of veto players, it will happen. Conversely, bad actors can undo even the best designed institutions. Maybe institutions don't matter, matter after all. Except the end. So, this short passage corresponds to the first thesis of my lecture. I'm not going to scrutinize either the institutional design or the text of the new Hungarian basic law, fundamental law, but the political culture of the actors involved in the recent constitution-making process in Hungary. A purely textual analysis is a less arduous uh, undertaking for a comparative study because the text is an a priori given corpus, while an investigation of a constitution-making process requires an in-depth analysis of a complex procedure with many actors led by particular interests, motivations and assumptions, but constrained by some institutional factors. But to scrutinize the constitution-making process is an absolute necessity if we want to understand the political culture of a special country. It is necessary because the constitution-making process are special procedures at least on one point since they are the preconditions of all other political processes, there are no predetermined uh, written rules <coughs> for frameworking the process of the constitution making. And that is the point. The lack of any institutional constraints, the only factors that regulate the political actors' behavior are the habits and unwritten norms which are the results of the political culture of the actual given political community. That's why I think that the political culture has a priority over the institutional constraints if we are scrutinizing the constitution-making processes. So, how could we characterize the present-day political culture of Hungary? There are really a lot of deficiencies in Hungarian political culture, but I would highlight two of them. On one hand, it is definitely and extremely polarized without any chances for compromise between the parties. On the other hand, there is a lack of self-moderation, which is a very important factor of the realms of, the, of unwritten political norms. Despite of these claims, I am not fully agreed with Fukuyama on the condemnation of Mr. Orban's government. Not merely for the reason I do not judge the situation as tragic as depicted in, the, in Fukuyama's article, but the article doesn't consider the whole landscape of the Hungarian political culture, only the political behavior of the government and Mr. Orban. So, the second fundamental message of my lecture is, following, is the following. It is not only the government which is responsible 
for the antagonistic character and the lack of self-condemnation of the Hungarian political culture, but all of the political actors, including the opposition parties. There is no culture of His Majesty's loyal opposition. In the last 20 years, the opposition parties have always been the opponent of the whole system and not of the government. In order to get closer to the original cause of this lecture, the next question is as follows. Was this uncompromising and conflict-oriented character of the constitution-making process an inevitable consequence of the special characteristic of the Hungarian politics? Or there would have been other possibilities for finding a consensus or at least for, for more willingness to compromise. By comparing the recent constitution-making process in Hungary with other cases, we could find out whether the Hungarian case was an abnormal and a peculiar case, as it has been presented in the international media and by the opposition in Hungary, or rather a usual procedure. But if we want to compare the constitution-making processes, we should first determine which elements of the different processes should be compared. Herein, it is advised to distinguish between two kinds of elements of the procedures. On the one hand, we have to examine the essential factors or aspects of the process which determine the circumstances of the constitution-making. These are the following aspects. The subject of the constitution-making process. <coughs> Secondly, the moment or the timing of the constitution-making process. Thirdly, the duration or length of the process. Fourth, the awareness of the political parties about their actual and prospective power in the political battlefield. And fifth, the external and internal constraints. It means occupation, probably uh, consultation, or an obligat obligatory facultative referendum. So, First of all, let's take uh, the first aspect, that means the subject of the constitution-making process. Who is the subject of the process? There are at least three categories, depending on which of the three potential actors participate in the process. The three political actors are as, as, are as follows. The legislative branch, the executive branch, and the people who could participate mostly by referendum. The people appear as a contingent player in all the three cases. That means that the constitution-making process is conciliable with or without any referendum as well. The most desired case is, of course, a constitutional convention combined with a referendum, where the assembly is mandated merely for the constitution-making process and it should be dissolved after this task has been completed. But this is a nearby utopian case. And you can hardly find a couple of constitutional conventions in practice if you take the word literal. But who was the subject of the recent, recent constitution-making process in Hungary? From, from a completely formal viewpoint regarded, it was the parliament which adopted the new constitution. The executive branch hasn't participated formally in any phases of the process. However, it was clear that the most important decisions have been reached elsewhere, not in the parliament. The process suffered a lot of abrupt reversals, and two of the three parliamentary opposition parties have been boycotting the process nearby from the beginning, because the competence of the constitutional court had been restricted during this process. Therefore, the fundamental law was adopted by a narrow two-third majority in the absence of the left-wing opposition. There hasn't been any referendum on the new fundamental law. However, it should be also scrutinized who is responsible for the situation. <coughs> and contrary to Fukuyama and to the most international critics of the Fidesz government, I would argue here that both political sides have their own responsibilities on this question. The Fidesz party wasn't really generous in the process, they exploited truly the two-third majority in many situations, but the left-wing opposition has been suited to the traditions of uh, the Hungarian political culture as well. They were opposing not the government, but the whole process of the constitution-making, 
and the recently adopted new constitution. But the main character of the Hungarian constitution-making process from last year is certainly related to the timing of the process. And this is the second aspect which should be considered in a prospect comparative, anal prospective com a comparative analysis. In the international literature, there is a debate on the right timing of the constitution making. There are arguments pro and contra a constitution making during or immediately after a political process, which transforms a country from a dictatorship to a democracy. A consensus building is easier during the transformation process, and the constitution adopted by a wide spectrum of the political elite in a transformation process could be more enduring than a constitution adopted after an advanced democratization process. Then, an advanced democratization implicates a moderate or an extreme polarization of the political field, since democracy presupposes party competition. And to find a consensus or even a compromise after the emergence and consolidation of a competitive party system is much more difficult than during the transformation process. On the other hand, some political scientists claim that a premature and hastened constitution making could lead to a scanned constitution which misses the required coherence and could not integrate a consider considerable amount of interesting arguments. Moreover, the excited moments of the transformation processes don't truly really encourage the moderate debates and the rational argumentations. So, what about the Hungarian process regarding the timing uh, and the effect of the timing? The Hungarian process reinforces the argument that this constitution-making process is hardly conciliable, being consensus-oriented, after the democratization process had, has attained an advanced phase. Constitution-making in this time and after the consolidation of the democracy through the emergence of a competitive party system probably not necessarily, but in the most cases, leads to a conflict-dominated process. Beyond the extreme polarization and the lack of self-moderation, maybe the timing is the third factor of the special character of the recent constitution-making process in Hungary. Um, as for the third aspect of the comparative study of the constitution-making, the duration or length of the process correlates with a higher or lower level of legitimacy of the adopted constitution, according to many political scientists. During a prolonged process, the people have enough time to confront with the arguments of the parties. The discussion could contribute to the improvement of the political self-consciousness of the people. But concerning the Hungarian case, the question is when the process of the constitution making really began. Did it begin, begin after the setup of the authorized parliamentary ad hoc -Hope committee in June of 2010, or did it begin after the call for a draft constitution of the parliamentary parties in January 2011, maybe after the presentation of the draft constitution of the Fidesz party in March 2011? This question could be easily answered. These questions could be easily answered if we take into account the pure formalities. The process began with the setup of the ad hoc committee in June 2010. <coughs> in this case, we can say that the process endured for almost one year. But if you consider the date when the draft constitution of the Fidesz party was published, that is March 2011, and the date uh, of the adoption of the new constitution, that is April 2011, then it can be indeed criticized that it was a very rapid process without any intensive and substantive discussion on the draft. On the other hand, some additional arguments should be taken into account as well. The first constitution-making process in Hungary took place during the transformation process, and this caused a rapid constitutional change in uh, 8990, uh, but it took no more than two months. Moreover, the left-wing parties didn't take part in the parliamentary discussion last year, so there could not really be a long-term discussion on constitutional issues. Survey 
it is nevertheless important to remark that a prolonged dispute in combination with a deeply polarized public opinion, opinion could have even more intensified the polarization of the Hungarian politics. So, let's move on uh, to the fourth aspect of a prospective comparison of constitution-making procedures. This is the awareness of the parties of the actual and prospective political power in the political system. This awareness is important because the expectation and the presumed interest of the parties influence their motivation, their strategies and behavior, that means their political culture. The theoretical best case is when the political actors don't have any information about their political power. This would be the well-known condition of the veil of ignorance, where the political parties are constrained by their fear of a forthcoming overwhelming majority which could disregard all interest of the minority. Due to this fear, or due to the fear not being a member of this majority, but being overruled as a member of a minority, every political actor wants to set up guarantees for the minority groups and limit the power of the majority. But even by confronting this question, we should warn of the danger of false idealism. Situations resembling the veil of ignorance are very rare. If you accept, however, that the parties which partake in the constitution-making process are mostly aware of their actual and potential power, then the most important question is whether the allocation of the power is even or uneven. And the common thesis of the political science could be phrased as follows. If the political actors are aware of their actual and prospective political power, and the actual political power is uneven allocated in a way that one homogeneous political actor is, is able uh, to make a constitution, then the new constitution will reflect the perception and ideology of this political power unless this homogeneous political actor is generous enough to respect some ideas of the opposition parties. This is the result of the logic of the politics. The political parties want always to maximize their win and minimize their loss. They are led by their egoistic interests and peculiar motivations. After this short uh, theoretical consideration, let's turn again to the Hungarian case. If you compare <coughs> the last three constitution-making processes in Hungary, we will find out that the first process in uh, 1890 uh, was an almost typical case of constitution making under the veil of ignorance. The second case, between 94 and 97, was an unsuccessful procedure resembling to the situation mentioned above when the political actors are aware of the actual power and this power, has, this power was uneven allocated. The two party coalition. Uh, between uh, 94 and 98 had a comfortable two sub majority. So, it should be remarked, however, that the colluding interests of the two governing, the governing parties between uh, 94 and 98 led to a failure of the constitution making process. The third effort from last year to give a new constitution for Hungary succeeded. But it was dominated by one party and characterized by, a, by the poetry <coughs> and the total absence of the left wing opposition. A typical example for the common thesis put in the last section. Due to the homogeneous two third majority in parliament, due to the radical polarization and to the lack of the self moderation of both political sides, the conceptions of the this, of this super majority prevailed in the adopted fundamental law. However, we should make it clear once again, the successful but in some regard rather odd process was a consequence of four factors. These factors are as following. First of all, the radical polarization of the politics, secondly, the normal party competition as a backlash of the timing of the constitution-making process, 
certainly the unique super majority of the Fidesz party, and last but not least, the lack of self-moderation on both political sides. So before closing this lecture, I would like to show what kind of effects of this peculiar political culture of Hungary could have on the recently adopted constitution, even in case of a very permissive constitutional text, which doesn't exclude any member of the political community. I'm going to focus on the first line of the new fundamental law, as uh, Mr. Kirkre did it as well. It corresponds literally to the first line of the national anthem of Hungary, God bless the Hungaria. It can, can be interpreted literally and as a reference to the national anthem of Hungary, Hungary as well. I think it is a short, brilliant and ingenious solution of the problem how a text could be made acceptable for both believers and atheists. As for the believers, they can read the text as a literary conjuration to God with the intention to ask him for protecting the Hungarian. On the other hand, an atheist can read these few words as a reference to the national anthem without being compelled to accept the religious content of this short message. If the atheists want to read this short reference exclusively as a reference to the national anthem, they can do it. It's up to them. Given that the most people accept the anthem of their country, it cannot be difficult to accept the first line of the new fundamental law. But here we have arrived to the central problem of the Hungarian political culture, because the atheists don't want to read this first line as a reference to the national anthem, but they pretend to be forced to read it as a religious content. So what is the reason, uh, what is the reason of this phenomenon? I think it can be explained only by the pretextual analysis of the political situation and the political culture of Hungary. It can be explained only by the phenomenon of the system opposition, which is a consequence of the lack of the self-moderation on both sides, government and the opposition. Even if a text is very permissive and concessive, even if a text could integrate both atheists and believers, the desired effect could not be reached because the, next, because the text originated not in a dialogue and compromise-making process, but it was adopted only by one political power. And this is the reason why the opponents of the text pretend that they are forced to accept religious contents. The constitution-making process determines, determine, determines the interpretation and the acceptance of the new fundamental law. To put it in another way, the political culture as reflected in the constitution-making process prevents the opposition from adhering to a constitution which was adopted only by the political adversary. So, to conclude shortly, only a comparative analysis could clarify the question whether this is a Hungarian peculiarity or not. That's why I'm going to make an in-depth conclusion in the next few months. Thank you very much, Dr. Posa. We're looking forward to the results of your comparison. Uh, I hope uh, you will be able to uh, present it to us, either personally or via your text. And uh, before we discuss this presentation, uh, we now turn to Dr. Arthur Wawek, who is going to speak, if I'm correct, but he will speak for himself, of course, but the, the title of his presentation is Informal Rules and the Polish Constitution. That's right, it reads like this. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, my point of departure is quite similar to, to Dr. Potsova. Uh, because uh, we, all, we probably all have problems uh, with the constitutions that work differently uh, than they are written. Okay, as you've said, the permissive constitution is interpreted as if it was uh, 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 a religious state uh, declaration. Uh, so the, the question is why it works so, 
why does it work so? Uh, and your answer is, the, is political culture. Uh, and I'm trying to do something, uh, something else. Uh, basically, I'm trying to, to show that there is another normative system than the law that works as a proper normative system uh, and uh, actually wins over the law, wins over the constitution. And these are my informal rules, they are sometimes called uh, informal institutions as well. Uh, okay, so first I, I try to uh, set a sort of theoretical framework what I mean by these informal rules or informal institutions uh, and then I'll try to show how it works with the, with the Polish constitution of 1997. Uh, so the focus of, of this uh, research is uh, constitution as a, as a regular regulator of the political process. Okay, so uh, the question is whether the constitution is the regular a regulator of the political process. Uh, and this is actually a, a basic idea of constitutionalism, that the constitution is the, the major, the only probably regulator of the political process. We, we had this during the Professor Smikuli presentation. Uh, so the idea is that we tie up our hands uh, today, writing constitution, but we tie up our future uh, 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 deeds according to our present ideas and our present knowledge about the political process. Uh, this is the, at least, uh, this is how I understand the, the basic idea behind constitutionalism. And it obviously works perfectly in, in two settings. First is a sort of stable regime where uh, politics doesn't change that much. And constitution is a sort of law profile, rules and regulations describing the way politics uh, really works anyway. Uh, and it's the example, I don't know, uh, Scandinavian constitution. That's not a major, I mean, it's a, it's a simply a rules of uh, rules and regulations of a, of a well organized uh, 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 corporation, if you will. Uh, and the second uh, setting where when it works, it's the revolution. Okay, because uh, at that time authority is derived from this pathos of uh, the change, the novelty. And afterwards, the memory of the founding fathers ensures the compliance, even if politics changes. Uh, obviously, provided there is a, a mechanism for the adjustment and interpretation, like uh, Supreme Court. Now, you, you know all this Arendtian story. So, the problem is that uh, in Central Europe we uh, didn't have uh, a revolution properly understood, neither we have uh, uh, stable regimes, we, we have permanent change, uh, which means that, okay, perhaps our present ideas might be the direction for the uh, restriction of our future deeds, but our knowledge of the political situation, our today's knowledge, is not enough for the uh, restriction of our future deeds in the future. Okay, so we, must, we even if we are, say, uh, uh, believing liberals and we want to write a 100% Rawlsian constitution, we don't know uh, what is behind the uh, veil of ignorance, and this means that uh, once we are in the situation that was behind the veil of ignorance, we might be surprised. Uh, we might be surprised that Rose was wrong, and we uh, uh, we want to change it, and our hands are uh, tied up. Uh, so uh, this is the problem more with the knowledge of the future states 
of politics uh, than uh, the, the problems with the ideas. Uh, because uh, you can hardly find authority that explains why should we obey the rules that were introduced by our enemies exactly with the aim to curb our power when they would lose their power. Okay, so uh, if behind the veil of ignorance a constitution is uh, accepted, uh, it's in practical terms, it's quite often written against somebody, and this, and if this somebody takes over uh, next term, there is no authority to tell him, I mean the party probably, uh, uh, to accept the rules that were exactly written against uh, against uh, uh, the, the, the future uh, rulers. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the constitution. So either you have a, a fully consensual, consensual constitution, uh, which is probably not the case. In uh, uh, well, which is not the case of uh, other countries. These. Uh, uh, out of, except for these newly independent, like Lithuania, uh, Latvia, uh, well, Latvia meaning uh, uh, Latvian citizens, Estonia, or probably Czech Republic. The, 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 you might say that there was a, a fully consensual constitution there. So either you have a consensual constitution or you don't have the uh, persuasive argument uh, to keep the rules. Uh, uh, that were introduced by a moment of uh, political change. So what happens in this situation? So you may assume that either you have a, 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 a sort of uh, uh, imposed constitution or chaos. But we know that uh, neither situation is typical. Okay? So it's more like the Polish case that the constitution was partly imposed and partly consensual uh, and uh, uh, chaos due to the lack of constitution is, is not a, 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 a viable example of, of a, a real life politics. So what happens? Uh, in this situation the informal rules uh, step in. Uh, what I mean by informal rules? So they are um, rules that are created, communicated and executed outside the officially sanctioned channels. But they are true rules, meaning that they are recognized by society and the political elite as binding, okay? which is a definition of the rule. Uh, and this sort of rules obviously exist in, in any political setting. So the, uh, the handbook example is uh, the seniority rule in the US Congress, uh, which says that the chairman of the chairperson of the committee in the US Congress is the longest serving uh, um, member of the majority party. It's not written in any uh, rules and regulations and it's almost uh, universally accepted. Well, it happens very rarely that, uh, that well, quite consensually they, uh, they agree not to accept this rule. Okay? It's a sort of low-profile rule, but it gives you the taste uh, what the informal rule might be. So they may uh, complement formal rules, they may adapt formal rules to uh, reality, they may compete uh, uh, with uh, formal rules, or they may substitute uh, uh, formal rules. Uh, and I argue uh, uh, that the informal rules are of major importance to understand the politics in Central Eastern Europe in the 90s, uh, but they still have uh, uh, much of influence in, in uh, uh, Central European uh, politics. Okay, so now I wanted to, to show you uh, how it worked in Poland uh, uh, under the 1997 uh, constitution. So I could uh, 
rather less rosy uh, 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 vision of the uh, 1997 constitution. Well, it was based on a, uh, on a compromise, as uh, Professor Mikuli said. Uh, but this was uh, uh, a compromise that excluded right-wing parties. Because this was, uh, the constitution was written uh, during the term 1993-1997, where when the right-wing parties uh, didn't get into the parliament, uh, so it was based on a compromise of the post-communist uh, left-wing party, peasant party and uh, liberal party. But obviously this sort of constitutional coalition wouldn't work in Poland, uh, so uh, there was a sort of uh, uh, Catholic uh, or, or Catholic hierarchy contribution to the, to the constitution. Okay, so, uh, so this is the spectrum for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, compromise. Uh, and uh, in the dimension that is most interesting for me, that is uh, the uh, 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 power organ setup, uh, it's quite messy. Okay, so it is messy in terms of axiology, uh, but it's not my cup of tea at the moment. Uh, but it's also uh, it's also quite messy in terms of uh, um, uh, power distribution. So it was basically written against the strong presidency uh, because uh, everybody expected the second term of uh, President Valenza, uh, who probably believed in a strong presidency, even though he was much more chaotic than strong. Uh, that's one, uh, but it was finished only after uh, Valenza lost the election. So, uh, uh, on this basic structure of uh, parliamentary democracy, uh, there, there were certain uh, additions uh, by uh, President Kwasniewski or by the colleagues of President Kwasniewski when he was, he had already been elected. Uh, okay, uh, but anyway, the compromise was the major value uh, of the Constitution, otherwise it wouldn't be introduced, uh, but it was uh, more like a summary of the first stage of the transformation uh, than a broad political vision, which means that the Constitution only mildly ameliorated the practice of the 1990s uh, and it also means that it didn't become a major barrier against the informal rules that prevailed in the Polish politics of the 90s. Uh, and I get a quite surprising quotation uh, from a professor of law who happened to be a Constitutional Court uh, judge and by no means uh, can be associated uh, uh, with the right-wing parties. Uh, so he uh, assessed the uh, uh, five-year period of uh, the new constitution uh, with, the word, with the words more or less like this, that uh, legal constitutional uh, regulations uh, are not the only, and in certain situations, not the most influential, decisive factor describing the practical status, uh, meaning and uh, rules for the functioning of uh, the institutions of power. Okay, so if a constitutional court judge says that uh, law is not, constitutional law is not the uh, most important decisive factor uh, uh, describing uh, uh, practical uh, execution of power, well, it means that uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, to do with the rest of it, do we? I mean, uh, so, uh, 
it definitely means that there is something stronger than, than, the, than the constitutional law, at least uh, from the perspective of the uh, uh, constitutional court judge. Okay, and I wanted to give you an example uh, of uh, a, a, a sort of informal institution that prevailed over the uh, new constitution uh, rules. Uh, and uh, uh, I chose the relationship between the Prime Minister and President, uh, which is an obvious choice for every poll, because uh, 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 this is the, probably the most televised uh, uh, conflict of the last 15 years, uh, irrespective of who the Prime Minister and who the President is. Okay. Uh, so, the Constitution itself uh, really strengthened the Prime Minister uh, and made him a, a real head of government and the government made the organ of the executive responsible for the state of public affairs. And the Constitution really weakened the presidency, depriving it a major say in the process of government construction <coughs> and destruction, which is no less important. Uh, it weakened the legislative uh, veto, it precised uh, the exclusive prerogatives of the president, uh, it introduced the constructive no-confidence vote, so exclusive, uh, exclusively. Uh, so, uh, from the uh, uh, letter of the constitution, you, you might read that this is basically a, a parliamentary system with uh, a strange popularly elected president, nobody knows why. Uh, but there are systems like this, Austria for example, so it happens, it happens, okay? Uh, the, the competences of, of the president, uh, uh, the, the political competences of the president uh, uh, were probably restricted to, uh, uh, to the legislative veto that could be uh, quite easily, as it seemed, overruled. Uh, but the practice was quite different, or radically different. So, the uh, as the situation of cohabitation uh, was more typical than untypical in the period after 97, well, up to the last elections, probably, uh, President developed a, a whole array of practices to block the government. So, the strategic use of veto made uh, President Kwasniewski to win 24 times over the right-wing government, uh, and only one veto was overruled by the same. Uh, and the uh, uh, strongly criticized President Kaczynski used the veto 16 times uh, uh, against uh, uh, Donald Tusk, but his record was uh, not that impressive. Uh, we two, I guess, weren't overruled. Uh, well, Kaczynski skillfully fought even uh, the Prime Minister from his own party uh, when he realized that, uh, uh, that Leszek Miller, the guy, uh, amassed too much power. Uh, so this only political, uh, politically meaningful uh, uh, measure of the influence of politics uh, was uh, masterfully used by the presidents. Well, presidents used also the head of state powers, which are basically purely formal, notary-like powers. Uh, but they use it against the government to block the government uh, decisions, including nominations for the ambassadors, nominations for the uh, military posts. Uh, which gave the picture that uh, actually there is a conflict of two more or less equally uh, 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 weighted uh, uh, sides. Uh, 
which wasn't the case because the presidents weren't trying to uh, make their own politics because they didn't have uh, powers to make politics, they didn't have personnel to, uh, to make politics, but they had enough of power to block, uh, to block the government's uh, policies. Uh, so I call it a blocking rule, uh, uh, an institution of blockage, uh, which, is, uh, which, which might read like to restrict the sphere where the competitor may uh, take decisions independently, okay? Uh, which is not equal to widening one's power. And it is a typically a transitory rule, okay? It was introduced to Polish politics in, around the round table uh, uh, as, a, as a transitory rule to make sure that the uh, solidarity wouldn't uh, uh, take power fully and to make sure that the process of uh, uh, democratization wouldn't be reversed. So it's a sort of transitory rule that uh, in the situation of uncertainty lowers the stakes. It's Przewalski's uh, description, lowering the stakes. Uh, and it uh, survived even the uh, dissolution of and this, uh, uh, this catastrophe, uh, this disaster with, uh, of the post-communist camp. Now we don't have post-communist camp and post-solidarity camp. We've got two rather right-wing parties uh, 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 who have nothing to do with the round table and nothing to do with the with the situation of uncertainty uh, during the transition, but we still have this uh, rule of, uh, of uh, blocking. Uh, and even if you, if you listen to the present uh, uh, president, who uh, uh, was rather um, low-profile politician of, of the ruling party, uh, and if you listen to gossips uh, that surround him, uh, he only waits for the time when, when the prime minister gets uh, uh, weaker, okay, to to use the uh, the uh, uh, instruments the the presidency gives him to block and to uh, the prime minister and to press for for his uh, uh, I don't know what sort of ideas. It's, it's, Okay, uh, so I think that the, uh, this concept of informal rules as prevailing over constitutional rules is quite useful uh, in order to understand uh, even the present situation in uh, uh, Central Eastern European countries. And it might be also enlightening uh, while analyzing the Hungarian constitution making process and the, the Hungarian constitution as uh, well you, you may ask the questions whether whether the new constitution would be a barrier for uh, for the uh, informal rules that prevailed in the 90s it uh, you may ask the question whether the situation changed that much uh, in Hungary, that Hungary needed uh, a new set of rules uh, because the informal rules were that strong that pressed for the change of the uh, uh, constitutional rules. I don't know because I, I, I was uh, well, I was educated in the uh, in the picture of uh, Hungary as this this description shared out republic uh, by Kereseni. Uh, okay, with, with strong restrictions on, on the, uh, especially on the executive, due to these two-thirds laws uh, established at the round table. Okay, and now I read that, uh, well, uh, the, it is a majoritarian democracy, and it's not the description of the situation after the elections, but also before the This is a majoritarian democracy. Okay, so I don't know how to uh, 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 
this, uh, decide whether uh, it's still a shared out republic or a majoritarian democracy. But if it is a majoritarian democracy, then this new constitution would be uh, understandable as the implementation of the informal rules that change the, the old informal rules of this sharing out the power. Okay, so th this was a, a sort of uh, advertising for, for this concept of uh, 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 informal rules or informal institutions as a, as a useful measure, uh, a useful instrument for understanding the relationship between constitution as, and the political process. Thank you.